full house today. Good afternoon and welcome to EPA. Thank you all for joining us today. I know that a lot of hard work went into today's event and I want to thank all the staff from EPA, USDA and FDA that were involved. It's a privilege to be joined by Secretary Perdue, Deputy Commissioner Frank Giannis. Um, thank you for your continued leadership across so many important issues, particularly food waste. Um, last week, President Trump declared the month of April as winning on reducing food waste month. The President knows, and we all know, that reducing food waste is a critically important issue facing this nation. Food accounts for the largest share of municipal solid waste going to our landfills. In one sense, this is a problem derived from America's incredible achievements in agriculture and technology. There are other nations around the world that don't have the problem of excess food. This reminds me of a story about Boris Yeltsin visiting America. Before he became president of Russia, Yeltsin visited Houston in 1989 to see NASA's Space Center. The trip had a profound impact on him, but it wasn't NASA or its technology. It was an unscheduled trip to a nearby Randall's grocery store. Uh, the Russian leader <coughs> roamed the aisles in <coughs> awe. He thought the store had been staged for his visit. He couldn't believe that there were thousands of items for sale and so many choices for the average American consumer. He told his colleagues that if the Russian people saw U.S. supermarkets, that there would be a revolution. The story illustrates why American agriculture and food production is the envy of the world. Our challenge now is challenging that same ingenuity into maximizing the value of food resources. Keeping excess food out of landfills not only helps the environment, but it can also be used to feed people, animals, or create energy. And keeping food out of landfills also creates jobs. We estimate that roughly 50,000 jobs are supported by food reuse, recycling, and recovering operations in the United States. I'm proud of the progress we've made since the launch of the Winning on Reducing Food Waste Initiative last year. We've reconvened today to further that progress. Informed by the work of the agencies, over the last year, today we are releasing a winning on reducing food waste federal interagency strategy. The strategy identifies six main areas we are prioritizing for action, areas such as consumer education and food date labeling. And if you want visual proof of our progress, check out our new big billboard at the Washington Nationals Park, where we highlight the fact that 30 to 40 percent of all available food in the U.S. is wasted. The billboard will be featured at the stadium for the entire month of April in honor of the President's declaration and to raise more public awareness on the need to reduce food waste. There's a lot of important work being done at the state and local level, and we're focused on providing the national leadership needed to elevate and amplify these efforts across the country. But we need your help to get the message out to all the populations within the supply chain. We're delighted that many state and local governments are already on board as evidenced by those here today who signed a new state and local pledge to help carry our message into their communities. The pledge is on display behind me. You can see that we already have commitments from major nonpartisan groups such as the National Association of Counties, the National League of Cities, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and the Environmental Council of the States. At the federal level, we are committed to doing our part to support food waste reduction projects and raise public awareness. Today, we are announcing that EPA has awarded funding for several state and local projects that will expand anaerobic digester capacity, which is a fancy term for infrastructure projects that break down organic materials and won't increase methane in landfills and create byproducts that can be used as renewable energy and soil additives. Personally, I thought the <laughs> name was easier to understand than the definition. The next round of funding will be available in the near future. If you know of similar innovative projects in need of funding, please encourage them to apply and contact Peter Wright or Tate Bennett on our team here at EPA. Finally, in a few minutes, all three agencies will be signing a first-time formal agreement with ReFed, the premier NGO in the food waste reduction policy arena. ReFed brings industry, environmental groups, and state and local leaders together to find data-driven solutions that fit the unique needs of all 50 states. The purpose of the formal agreement is to streamline our existing efforts so that our state and local partners have effective strategies to implement on the ground. 
It's important that the leading technical experts in the food waste policy arena are working closely together with food waste experts at our respective agencies. This type of collaboration is paramount to success, and this is what we hope today's event and the upcoming panel discussion will generate. Together, we can promote American prosperity and turn wasted food into solutions that can feed Americans' communities, fuel our economy, and maximize our resources. Thank you all for joining us today, and it's now my privilege to introduce a true champion of America's farmers and ranchers, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Secretary Perdue. Thank you, Administrator Wheeler, and uh, you've thanked other people, but I want to thank you for your leadership in hosting this event today. It's a, a great example of interagency partnership between uh, the EPA, the FDA, and the USDA uh, in a very important topic, and I want to thank you for uh, uh, hosting this event uh, on the critical topic of food waste. You know, last fall we met and signed a formal agreement, Winning and Reducing Food Waste Initiative, and oftentimes in D.C. we know things that happen uh, by press release and episodically. I think today's, uh, again, formal agreement, certainly with our private sector partners and NGOs, indicate this is an ongoing effort that we're serious about and this administration takes seriously about the cultural change of reducing food waste, which is really all of our responsibilities. We three agencies cannot do it alone, and even with the great help of Refed America, and, uh, and other NGOs, it takes all of us. And that's really what we want to talk about here today, signing a memorandum of understanding that, uh, uh, or a, a formal agreement to commit to uh, certain metrics and measurements about how we can achieve the good goals. Uh, as Administrator Wheeler indicated, President Trump uh, did commemorate the month of April as winning on reducing food waste month, the historic achievement actually, and proof that even at the highest levels of government, food waste is an issue of importance. You wouldn't think, frankly, this, this administration would be talking about food waste, but that's uh, when you look at the benefits that Administrator Wheeler talked about, you see why it is, uh, it's good. I want to take just a second to talk about the why uh, that we're focused on this topic. As the Administrator said, American farmers and producers, ranchers, are the most productive in the world. In fact, uh, uh, we produce an abundance of food to feed the world, and uh, we want that abundance to feed and nourish people, not uh, filling the trash in landfills across the country. So a big why is literally, if you look at the demographic statistics projections, we're going to have a big, hungry world to feed in not too very distant future. So we know that, sadly, the statistics that he talked about, the billboard, 30 to 40 percent of our food supply is lost, wasted, and that is absolutely unacceptable. That's immoral for a country like the United States to, to waste anywhere near that amount uh, of food. The truth is the world's population uh, is going to grow to, we anticipate, 10 billion people, possibly by 2050. And uh, the fact is, sadly, we know there are hungry people right here in America today that can utilize this, uh, this wasteful uh, abundance that we that we uh, uh, have here. So it's going to take, as I indicated, a cultural change to reduce food waste from the farm to the table. I think it involves all of us, everyone. That's why we're happy to have you here today to hear the vision and help us communicate the message. I think especially to the next generation of consumers. It's, uh, it's almost the consumers that have led us in seatbelt usage and other things as we communicate to them in the environment and elementary school and that, how they can lead us into being better stewards of the land, better stewards of the bounty of this land uh, with food waste. So that's why later this month, the EPA and the FDA and the USDA will announce a virtual student competition that on food waste for kids uh, ages 11 to 18 as part of the Winning on Reducing Food Waste Month. So we're actively seeking partners outside of government to work with us on consumer education. You guys in the private sector always do a better job in communications than, than we do, so we need your help. Another big why is really food security and for people right here in our own country. And I recently visited, a, it was a great operation administrator. I hope you can go there with me sometime. It's called, it was Second Helpings in, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
They've been operating for several years, I think since the late 80s, and it was a trifecta, really, of uh, taking food waste from uh, wholesalers and from uh, grocery stores that would be in, in potentially going out of date, taking that, preparing the food in, uh, to feed congregant gatherings all across about 90 different organizations in the greater Indianapolis area, feeding them congregant meals, and also while they were training SNAP recipients in culinary uh, training there. So it was really a trifecta of, of rescuing food, feeding hungry people, and training people how to use those skills to do that. So that was a real blessing. So we've had 23 organizations sign up as our U.S. Food Loss and Waste uh, 230 champ 2030 champions, and that was committing their companies and corporations and their influence to reducing food loss and waste in their operation by 50% by 2030. Now, if you're one of the organizations, thank you. We want you to encourage others to join you. If you're not one of those, I want to encourage you to join in this effort as well. So just think about it. The fact is much of this waste happens in the home at the consumer level, and we've got that's a cultural change as well. We blame sometimes the, uh, the post-harvest, and we blame the supply chain, we blame the grocery stores and all the supply chain there, but really a lot of this happens in our own refrigerators and our own places at home. So uh, you ever wondered how long peaches stay good in the refrigerator uh, <laughs> or a can of beans on the shelf? Those are the kind of things we want to train people. There's an app for that, an app for everything. USDA, along with the Food Marketing Institute and Cornell University, developed the Food Keeper app. So if you've got questions about it, uh, check out Food Keeper app. And uh, it's been used more than 225,000 times, so hopefully it can keep you from either deciding whether to throw away those peaches or keep them, and we want you to keep them. So uh, we're also committed to work alongside of our industry partners to standardize the way date labels are used on packaged food items, and that's why I'm glad our FDA is a partner in this effort as well. Many USDA missions are used to working on food waste from our food nutrition services to our food safety uh, institute to rural development to the economic research service, NIFA, and uh, agricultural research service. There's a lot of research and a lot of innovation occurring around food waste solutions across the country. And, uh, we're, part of, we're proud to be part of those solutions. So I want to emphasize that reducing food waste is not just another program to announce. When you engage in reducing food waste, you're doing it for a cause that will impact people's lives around the world. And whether it's at the farm, in the distribution chain, in a restaurant, in your own home, reducing, home, reducing food waste is a cause that really does make a difference. So you're helping to feed a hungry world, and you're helping to provide food security right here at home. So many of you have heard of our motto at uh, USDA, and we think this fits right in with it, do right and feed everyone. And uh, when you help reduce food waste, I think you're doing right to help feed everyone. As I indicated, we're glad to have our FDA as partners in this effort uh, with their labeling authorities. And today I'm happy to have uh, uh, Deputy Administrator, Deputy Commissioner Giannis who comes from the private sector, having dealt in food safety programs as well as logistic and blockchain. So he'll be a great addition at the uh, FDA and we look forward to working with him. Now help me welcome uh, Deputy Commissioner Giannis. Thank you, Secretary Purdue. Very pleased to be with you. Delighted to be talking about this very important societal topic of food waste. Uh, FDA is proud to be partnering with both EPA and USDA on this initiative, winning on reducing food waste. But as you heard, I came from the retail sector. I'd like to just pause and have you kind of tag along and follow with a visual story. Imagine going into your favorite grocery store, buying three bags of grocery, and as you walk out, you throw one of them in the garbage can. Does that sound ridiculous? Of course it does, but that is in essence what's happening with food waste around our country each and every day. Between the food industry and consumers, Americans are throwing out the equivalent of $165, $165 billion a year. As you know, FDA's mandate is to ensure the safety of the food supply, protecting consumers and families from contaminated food. Growing, processing, transporting food, and doing it safely 
consumes critical resources, and when food is wasted or lost, it uh, hinders those resources. The issues of food safety and food waste, in my mind, are intertwined, and they're both very important societal issues. It's not too hard to wonder why. If you think about one in six consumers will experience a foodborne illness annually, and a third of all food getting wasted, you can understand why it's so important. FDA is committed to working with both EPA, USDA, and other partners to further reduce the waste uh, in homes across the country and in the food system. For starters, we must do a better job, as you've heard here today, on date labeling foods to make it less confusing for consumers and customers. Research has shown that confusion over date labeling is a large contributor to food waste in the home. It's not too hard to understand why. If you've ever looked at the different products and the date labeling terminologies that exist on them, you could tell they're done many different ways, ranging from expires on, used by, best buy. And research has said that terminology that best conveys to consumers through studies that the date is intended for quality reasons only, not for safety, is the best of used by terminology. Surveys have shown consumers understand that that date means that product ne isn't necessarily bad. You can still eat that product past that date and you don't have to discard it. So FDA is working to advise our industry partners for those food products that we regulate that this is the standard terminology of choice. But we know that just standardizing around date labels isn't enough. We have to educate the public on what that means. And so we are committed in working with EPA and USDA to develop very consistent and harmonized consumer messages. We've done this through the development of consumer education materials, infographics, tip sheets, and information on our website. We have a landing page on FDA.gov that houses all of this material, and it also connects with EPA and USDA, and I encourage you to visit that website. More broadly, we're enhancing intra-agency coordination to make sure we're using our resources on this issue very successfully, effectively, so that we have clear goals and strategies on how we further reduce food waste. And FDA is looking at our own federal operations, including our cafeterias and concessions, to make sure that we're reducing our own contribution to food waste and reducing our footprint. As our former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb said at a previous Reducing Food Waste Showcase in October, we're also working with the food industry to better understand and address obstacles to the effective and safe donation and recovery of unsold foods to help feed those in need. FDA ex experts regularly field questions from the food industry and we advise them on how they can safely donate foods uh, and it can be done safely. We're also engaging with state, local, and tribal health departments that do a lot of the inspections at retail and food service uh, organizations across the country to make sure they understand how it can be safely donated. The goal is to ensure that unsold food at retailers and food service establishments is safe and offers an opportunity to nourish Americans in need. We're also reviewing other certain FDA regulations and how they may impact our ability for retailers and other entities that we regulate to safely and legally donate foods that go unsold. In closing, uh, I'd like to emphasize whether you're in your home kitchen, whether you're in an FDA regulated establishment, decisions are being made every day across the country on food waste. Food is simply too important to waste as you've heard here. FDA, EPA, and USDA are committed to providing the resources needed to support safe and sound decisions, decisions that are good for families and their wallets, decisions that are good for our communities, and decisions that are good for our nation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Giannis, for your remarks and for your leadership on this issue. Um, in just a moment, I'll invite Secretary Purdue and the Commissioner to join me as we sign our first ever formal agreement with ReFed, the leading NGO in the food waste policy arena. But first, I have the privilege of introducing ReFed's operations manager, Katie Franklin. Katie will now talk about the work that ReFed does, and you'll see why we are all eager to work together. Katie? Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a real honor to be up here at the table with y'all and to even consider entering into an agreement with the three agencies. I think from ReFed's perspective, it's a huge sign of commitment and support and dedication to this topic. And I've heard from each of you kind of different angles at which this affects our lives and our nation and our communities. And at ReFed, we really see food waste as a strategy 
for addressing a whole host of different topics, whether it be climate change or economic development or food insecurity. And so I sincerely appreciate the work that y'all are putting into this and are looking forward to collaborating more, um, more closely with you guys and also furthering our work together and collaborating with others across the country too. Thank you, Katie. At this point, I'll ask all of us to sign the document in front of you to commemorate today's event. Okay, I see that we're right on time. So, good afternoon. I'm Peter Wright, Special Counsel to the Administrator for EPA's Office of Land and Emergency Management. And again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today for this very special and important event. Um, and I also want to thank those of you who are participating uh, via live stream uh, for being and helping us all to be part of the solution of reducing food waste. Uh, as, as you've seen, EPA is working closely with the USDA and FDA on winning on food waste. This administration is committed to helping improve the efficiency and management of the food systems. And while EPA and our uh, partners in the federal government play an important role in reducing food waste, as been said, much of the important work happens at a local level, uh, including at, across communities all across the United States. And for that reason, we've invited the panelists here today so you'll find out more about some of the really innovative and important work that's taking place to reduce food loss and waste in our communities. Each of the panelists will highlight some of the practices uh, that, that, again, you may find useful for your organization. And after all the panelists speak, I'll start with a few questions to the panelists, and then I will turn to the room to share what efforts you have found to be effective in reducing food loss and waste, and, ask, and you can also, of course, then ask questions about the panelists. So I'll uh, introduce our uh, first speaker, who's already uh, made some brief remarks, Katie Franklin from ReFed. Uh, as has been mentioned, ReFed is an organization that looks to data to, uh, to identify concrete opportunities for reducing food waste across the food supply chain. Uh, in their roadmap to, re uh, to reducing U.S. food waste, ReFed identified 27 of the most impactful opportunities for investors, governments, and businesses to save money, resources, feed people, and create jobs. Katie has an extensive knowledge of the global challenge of food waste, and she's authored industry and academic research on food waste. She's also helped develop the Further With Food, which is a natural virtual resource center that, that provides businesses, government entities, and investors, NGOs, academics, and individuals with a platform for finding and sharing solutions to reduce food waste, feed hungry people, and diverts food scrap to the highest beneficial use. So now I'll turn the floor to Katie so that she can share some of the tools and practices that can help states and communities reduce food waste and feed hungry people. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to steal this from you. Hello again. Um, as Peter said, my name is Katie Franklin. I'm Chief of Staff at ReFed. And I think I'm going to do this right. 
There we go. Um, you know, as has been mentioned, Refed is a U.S.-based nonprofit, and we are wholly dedicated to reducing U.S. food waste. And it is our mission and our vision to eliminate food waste in order to increase food security, spur economic growth, and protect the environment. And we take a systems-based approach to looking at food waste. So we help create and disseminate knowledge and more data and insights about how food waste can be reduced and get that out to the decision makers across the supply chain and across the food sector. We also look at opportunities to address market failures where there might be a lack of accountability, misaligned incentives, date labeling was mentioned a couple of times today and that's a, a particular one where an investment might be made by a manufacturer but benefits are reaped farther down the supply chain. So we look for opportunities to bring those actors and those systems together to strengthen, create and build markets and as do many of the other folks on this panel with me today. Um, so as you know, Peter already mentioned in, Refed published the roadmap to reduce U.S. food waste, and in doing so, I'm going to skip through some of these problems since we already talked about them. We identified 27 of the most cost-effective solutions to food waste across the prevention, recovery, and recycling hierarchy, and really took a data-based approach and provided the first economic analysis of solutions. And while the data might not be perfect and we're looking at opportunities to improve that today, it was one of the first times where we were actually able to put costs and benefits um, in a, from a financial perspective to those solutions, which is really critical for decision makers, especially in the business communities and investment communities, and even in the innovation and tech and startup communities. And so through the roadmap, we identified that just with these 27 solutions at that time in 2016, an $18 billion investment would return $100 billion in value over the coming decade. And that's a pretty significant return on investment. It's less than one-tenth of a penny per pound of food waste reduced. Um, and that includes real dollar benefits, such as business profits, but also some more intangible benefits, like greenhouse gas reductions, meals recovered, and um, addressing things like food insecurity and environmental sustainability. So I just want um, so what we're focusing on this year is continuing to build out our knowledge platform and improve the data that's available for decision makers. And just wanted to highlight a couple of the um, ways that we've seen progress being made across the sector in food waste. So a few years ago, even back in 2015, when the national goal was announced, food waste might have been kind of a, a niche topic and still I wouldn't say is fully mainstream today, but in 2018, food waste actually did make national headlines as was competing with things like Instagram and other cool things that hip people know. Um, <laughs> we also now have more than two thirds of the top 50 global food companies committed to the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, which is in line with the, the Champion 2030 goal to cut food waste in half. And I know we have a couple of champions here in the room and some of these have already achieved that goal. Um, and we're very proud to say that we've worked with some of those folks and are really respect the different companies and organizations that are stepping up and taking action on this. We've also seen a burgeoning sector of startup and corporate innovation. Refed manages an innovator database of over 500 for-profit and non-profit startups, and more than half of those were founded in the past decade. And this is only capturing the startup innovation. This doesn't even consider things like Walmart's Eden, which created an opportunity for $2 billion in savings. We've also seen a huge amount of money going into this space, which is much, much needed, both to advance things like research and implementation of solutions, but also R&D and innovation. So you've seen both the philanthropic and the private and public funding sectors really step up their game and make commitments. In addition to, to some of the names you see here, uh, you know, programs like Cal Recycles, uh, California Cal Recycles program has issued over 40 million in grants. Um, Connecticut's Green Bank has also been a great champion of funding food waste opportunities. And as you heard at the federal level, there are continued opportunities for more investment in these solutions. We also saw just a huge wave of legislation and policy action on food waste in the past 12 to 18 months. Over 90 pieces of legislation were introduced across 30 states and at the federal level. We also saw unprecedented coverage of food waste in the Farm Bill. 
and I, I know we still need to get some funds appropriated for some of that work, but just the fact that it was brought up and so many opportunities were authorized through that farm bill was a huge sign from the different agencies in Congress that food waste is a priority. And I think just kind of it, the last thing I'd, I'd say about food waste and how we think about it at, at Refed is that it really is a solvable problem. We don't solve food waste for food waste's sake. You heard all of the different motivations, or some of them at least, mentioned up here already today. But we think this is a genuine strategy for addressing bigger national and global challenges, water scarcity, hunger, climate change, soil health, you name it. Food waste touches it, and it affects all of us. You know, we've, we've heard kind of from the retail to the consumer end of how valuable it is to protect the food that we're eating or the food that we're producing. And so, um, <laughs> sorry. so I think I, I would just emphasize that we've made incredible progress so far and have a long way to go. And I think every time we work with a new partner at Refed, um, something that we love to hear is that we can't do it alone. And we truly believe that, that we must collaborate on this topic, which is why it was so important to Refed that we've seen collaborative action from the different agencies, we've seen collaborative action from the voluntary private and public sectors, and we continue to pursue those opportunities, uh, both through our existing partnerships and, and looking for other partnerships to advance work. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Well, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Lawrence Macluso, who's held several roles in his uh, 17 years working uh, on food waste and, er and energy matters at the Center for Eco-Technology. Lorenzo has helped several states, local governments, and businesses create or enhance their food waste programs. He's developed a comp composting uh, toolkit for restaurants and schools, as well as developed best practice guidance for donation and prevention at businesses and institutions. His work has helped to develop and oversee the implementation of the Center's uh, Green Business Services, which provides waste diversion and energy efficiency in information and technical assistance to a wide range of organizations throughout New England and the nation. I look forward to hearing Lorenzo share some lessons he's learned about the Center's partnership with communities throughout the United States. And with, with, with. Thank you very much, Peter, and, and thank you, thank you all for having me here today. It's really um, an honor to be part of this very important event and this, this awesome panel here. Uh, so again, my name is Lorenzo Macaluso. I am from the Center for Ecotechnology, and we are an environmental nonprofit organization that's been around for over 40 years now and have about 70 professionals on staff that help people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. And we've been working on the wasted food issue for, for over 20 years now, and we're really excited uh, to be able to have the opportunity to share some of the things that we've seen as successful here with all of you today, and especially in this building. Uh, since 20 years ago when we got started, some of our first support was from USDA and EPA. We're incredibly thankful for that, and our, uh, the New England offices have been great uh, partners for us uh, where we're based, and, and to be able to, to contribute to this goal of, of cutting food waste in half uh, by 2030 is, is really central to what we do, and we're excited about that. And so as a way of a little bit of background and to kind of get some context to what we're seeing as being really effective, I wanted to share a little bit about our approach to the work that we do. And I'm sure most of us here are quite familiar with the hierarchy, the recovery hierarchy. We fully subscribe to this. Um, but when, when we look at this, uh, we think about who are the solution providers at each of the levels of this uh, recovery hierarchy? Because we're not a food recovery organization or a composter or a hall or an anaerobic digestion facility or one of the prevention apps that are so successful now. But our job is to get to know each of those solution providers really well, what they need to succeed, what their market niche is, and then armed with that information, we go out and engage with the food businesses that, ha that generate food waste, and then basically play matchmaker and facilitate solutions that make sense at their business, and we feel like give them practical information that makes good business sense for them. And so when we, when we do this kind of work, we're seeing that the solution providers are succeeding and growing, food businesses are succeeding in, di in diverting materials, and the policymakers are reaching their goals. And so uh, as we reflect, oh, Got an there we go, that's, here we go. Uh, as we think about what we've done, and especially this last several years where there's been quite a bit of momentum, uh, as Katie was mentioning, 
there's some set of factors that we're seeing really kind of move the needle. Uh, where policy is in place, uh, whether that's a, a disposal ban or the Good Samaritan Act enhancements or just zero waste goals, um, those are really important for sending the messages out. Where there's a regulatory aspect, having some enforcement so that there's an even playing field in the marketplace is important. Um, coupled, of course, with infrastructure. And I think traditionally we've thought of infrastructure very much as composting facilities, but there's been huge development in infrastructure and anaerobic digestion and depackaging facilities, these, uh, the apps that are out there and food rescue technology improvements. Um, all of those really contribute to what is the infrastructure to get this uh, issue addressed. And then the third, fourth puzzle piece there, that education and technical assistance is the role that we play. That, that matchmaking and, um, and assistance to both the solution providers and the generators to get more of this work done. Each of these puzzle pieces can and do work independently, but we're finding that when they're all working simultaneously in a given marketplace, that's when we're seeing the fastest transformation, the biggest uptick in activity, and the most impact. And so to kind of illustrate this a little further, I figured I'd share a couple of examples with you of, of the work that we're doing. Um, first in Massachusetts, where we're based, uh, there's, we feel very fortunate to have uh, the policy that's been in place. There's a, there's a food waste ban in Massachusetts, and we are under contract with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, where we created and now run the Recycling Works program, which is a statewide business assistance program to help businesses navigate this. We are seeing thousands, tens of thousands of visits to our website, um, about 1,500 calls a year coming into our call center, and we're helping hundreds and hundreds of businesses with actually implementing solutions at their locations. And when we do that kind of work, we're contributing to the impact of about $175 million worth of economic activity in Massachusetts around food waste, supporting about 900 jobs, and nearly tripling the amount of food waste that's been um, diverted from disposal in the last several years. We've been growing our, our impact and our geography, and we're doing a project in Philadelphia right now with a number of stakeholders. Uh, and one of the projects that we're working on is with the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association, who, who noted to us in some conversations that their membership was asking questions about what to do about food waste, and they didn't know the answer. And so they had an expo this uh, fall at, at, in Philly, and we put together a panel to talk about how to address this issue. Um, it was their most well-attended session at the expo, and now we're helping a number of restaurants in a very strategic way that we think is gonna help um, unlock some marketplace opportunities beyond the project period. And finally, one last example is in San Diego, uh, where Cal, Cal Recycle and the, California has a, a, several policies in place that ask their jurisdictions to provide information to businesses on how to uh, divert food waste, but we're finding that especially in the smaller jurisdictions, they lack the technical knowledge and experience to really know how to do this. So we're working with CalRecycle, the Solana Center, and the San Diego Food Systems Alliance to develop some practical tip sheets with some local examples so that those jurisdictions can provide that information um, locally and get more implementation work done right in their area. So when we do this kind of work, we're really excited about the kind of impact that we're having and there it is. And uh, in, the, in the, just in these last several years, we've directly helped uh, divert over 115,000 tons of food waste from disposal and uh, helped facilitate the donation of over 17 million meals. And uh, we're, we're really excited about that and we know that that's just our direct touch and we know that the kind of speaking and facilitation and uh, capacity building work that we're doing around the country is, is many times more than this, but this is our direct touch that we're able to uh, share and, and we're thrilled to grow. And, boy, this is not, I promise, there we go. And so, uh, we're, we're, we have launched our Wasted Food Solutions website. There's lots of different resources on there that are very practical, not just the what to do, but how to actually do it at your facility. And we're, we're filling in this map as we go, so we hope to uh, follow up today and have even more uh, areas filled in, but there's lots of resources that are applicable no matter where you are and a lot of locally uh, relevant information on our website. And I'll wrap up with a, a similar message that we've already heard a number of times, that, that this issue is, is too big for any one entity to take on on its own. No, no one entity is going to solve it on its own. And it's really going to take the collaboration of all of us in this room and many others to to make the impact that we know that we can have. So we're very <coughs> thankful for all of our partners that we've worked with and that support us and we support them and we look forward to growing that partnership list 
um, over time. Uh, and so I look forward to the panel part of the discussion and thank you for your time. Uh, thanks very much, Lorenzo. So our next panelist is Richard Chesley from the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Uh, Richard's worked for the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control for 30 years, so I guess he must have started as a, what, teenage intern, uh, <laughs> in various capacities. Uh, he currently manages education and technology assistant in the Office of Solid Waste Reduction and Recycling. In his role, Richard helped launch the Don't Waste Food SC and Recycle More SC campaigns. The Don't Waste Food SC campaign was launched in 2016 as a partnership between the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control and the state's Department of Commerce. One goal of the campaign is for South Carolina to cut food waste in half by 2030. Today, Richard will share some successes and challenges that South Carolina has incurred in their efforts to feed people rather than landfills. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here today and privilege uh, to represent South Carolina and tell you what we're trying to do uh, regarding food waste. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, though, I'd be remiss to say that there's lots of folks back in Columbia and elsewhere in South Carolina that are making this possible. So uh, I appreciate your time. We, uh, like everyone in the room, we knew food waste was an issue for a long time. We just weren't sure what we were going to do about it. And uh, we had this food recovery summit, which we were going to start and have it on our own back in 2016. Uh, but the, uh, excuse me, 2015. But our first obstacle, our first issue in South Carolina was we had to update our composting organics regulations. They had not been updated since the 90s. They were updated in 2014 and uh, dealing with uh, wasted food and composting, et cetera. It made clear to um, companies that would want to come in to what, they, what the rules were, what they'd have to do and not do. It really made it a lot easier. So that updating the compost reg was huge for us to get this uh, initiative going. We then had the summit in 2015. Our initial goal was just to have the summit for, uh, our, for our local governments, our county governments. And then we ended up working and partnering with um, EPA and uh, CERDEC and our counterparts in North Carolina and BioCycle. And we had a national event that was very, very successful in Charleston. After that, we decided uh, we, we weren't sure uh, well, we kind of knew what we wanted to do, but we wanted to work it out. We went back to the agency and explained or at, at DHEC what we thought we could do as far as <coughs> developing a campaign and taking some leadership on this. And the agency uh, immediately uh, embraced, encouraged us to go ahead and do that. And then our next steps were to find out really what the foundation was, what was going on in South Carolina as far as all the other nonprofits, food banks, food rescue, et cetera, grocery stores, what everyone was doing. And we set up a meeting with these key sta stakeholders to uh, present the idea that, hey, would you like to develop a campaign together and do something about it? Obviously, with the goal of increasing or recovering more, more, more food. We had lots of folks at those, we had a series of meetings, had lots of folks there, and it was key for us, I'll talk about this in another minute or so, we had our Department of Commerce and our Recycling Market Development folks there and agriculture and the Department of Education, which was a key player, integral player in us getting schools involved. So it was decided we would develop a campaign and we would be the lead, and that's where we are today. We developed and introduced the Don't Waste Food SC campaign. The theme is obviously prevent, donate compost, but we follow the EPA hierarchy to try to get everything done. Uh, so the campaign was kicked off at Harvest Hope Food Bank, one of our stakeholders in July uh, 2016. Here's the obligatory successful picture of everyone there. <laughs> that good looking guy in the back there is me. Yeah, it should be bigger. Uh, but that's the campaign. Uh, we also had a, uh, our then governor, Nikki Haley, we had the, uh, 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 what do you call it? Proclamation. Proclamation, thank you. <laughs> we had a proclamation. That's what we had. And it all, we had a lot of media coverage, which is another lesson learned. We had a tremendous amount of media coverage at that event. The campaign is simple. We want to work with everybody. We want to bring everyone together, all the different stakeholders, and um, work together to uh, cooperate, share knowledge, work together, and also just do whatever we can together to reduce food waste in South Carolina. The three goals are simple. We want to increase awareness of the campaign. 
We want to talk about the social, the environmental, and economic impact of wasted food. And we want to cut food waste in half by 2030. We adopted what the EPA and FDA and everyone else did a couple years ago. We adopted that goal as well. We uh, are the lead in getting the word out about it. And we develop, we have our website, but we developed all kinds of education, outreach education materials, uh, technical uh, assistance and best management practices, obviously workshops, presentations, et cetera. And we have the, and pr also provided our agency, our office provides grant funding to schools and local governments to tie into this campaign and do something about uh, uh, wasted food, including those grants allow our local governments to work with the nonprofits as well. Obviously, you heard earlier, most wasted food occurs at home. We did uh, the, a, a composting guide, but for some reason I left this off. I, exhibit A is we have a, a guide for people at home, what they can do as far as smart shopping, smart uh, uh, storage, smart everything, smart preparation, working with leftovers. We have a guide for residents at home, and then it's a composting guide as well. So we target at home, we have all other kinds of information and really uh, to, to get the word out, to start again at home, to let everyone know. We, we know that, and I learned this uh, a lot from Melissa Terry, cafeteria is our classroom. One of our targets, again, was besides homes were schools. We did all we could. We had a composting guide for schools, but we uh, updated it to include uh, wasted food. And then we developed a guide working with different uh, schools and the Department of Education on what schools could do to set up and reduce wasted food. Uh, we have about 1,300 public schools in South Carolina, 750,000 plus students and 50,000 plus staff, et cetera. So it's impact every day. So that was a huge target for us. And I, I can share with you that it's working. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, these are other, uh, 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 other information material that we got out. The big ticket item was the share table rules. We got that question all the time. We'd get the call that DHEC doesn't allow us to do that. And we would always respond, I'm DHEC, you can do it. And we'll give you the guide and show you how to do it and help you. Uh, we still get those calls. I got an email today about we're not allowed to do it because you don't allow us. But uh, a big ticket item too was the uh, product dating that was discussed earlier. And that also impacted cafeterias. So we got the word out about that. Um, we have a, we're very blessed in South Carolina. We have a K-12 curriculum supplement. We go in and reach about 30,000 students a year and train about 1,000 to 1,500 teachers a year on our, our curriculum. And uh, with has a recycling theme, obviously, but we had added uh, wasted food lessons, and you can see that. So we actually go in the classroom as well and get the word out. We go out in the community uh, and do lots of different things. When we kicked off the campaign, I'm going quick because I'm running out of time, forgive me. <laughs> Um, we work with three counties, Horry County, which is Myrtle Beach, and uh, Sp uh, Greenville County, and uh, Charleston County all adopted the campaign. So that was the upstate, the middle of South Carolina, and the low country. I need to wrap it up. And we work with the City of Columbia and the Food Pol Policy Committee, and we use that app. I'm going quick. Harvest Hope, one of the things we're trying to do to campaign in the last 45 seconds here is brand it. And Harvest Hope put the logo on their truck. My biggest complaint, it wasn't big enough but they still put it on there and we're working with them. I think they cut me off. No, they didn't. <laughs> one of the advantages, and I am going quickly, is one of the advantages we have, uh, our agency is one of three in, in the nation. It's both health and environment. We have work with the nutrition and health side folks. We also work with the restaurant inspectors. They go out and drop this card off after restaurant inspections, encouraging restaurants to uh, donate food. And also that the, about the, uh, liability protection at the federal level, also in South Carolina. We have the ambassador programs. We're getting ready to kick off. We're asking everybody to do their part. If you do one thing, the waste or reduced food waste, and also uh, talk about it, promote it, you get to be an ambassador. And we're going to kick that off. We're trying to get everybody as soon as possible. We're trying to get the governor lined up. I like the watermelon. That's what you have to do, the two choices there, what you have to do to participate or what you have to do to uh, promote. Very simple to follow and we're media event. Lessons learned so far real quick. You have to have, um, you have to learn your foundation in your state to see what's going on and replace that, found, or respect that foundation and go from there. You have to develop partnerships. We could not get very far with schools. They're very conservative. We didn't have the Department of Education. Liability protection for restaurants front and center. We're not to the point, many of the restaurants are more concerned about quality than they are about liability. 
We make it personal. There's uh, nearly 700,000 South Carolinians are food insecure, <clears throat> one in seven adults, one in five children. That's unacceptable. We're doing what we can. Media is often, will, often a willing partner. The media has really helped us with this. They understand what we're trying to do, and they really believe in the... Uh, in the, in the issue, and we've gotten a lot of coverage, a lot of attention with this, and we're very proud of that. That's me, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. Uh, our final panelist uh, today is Ava Richardson. Ava is a technical expert on food system and sustainability and works in the Baltimore, Baltimore's Office of Sustainability. There she is helping to lead the city of Baltimore in food waste and rescue efforts. Some of the few rescue efforts are helping address the geographic and economic disparities related to accessing healthy foods. I was also a public health doctoral student at John Hopkins University. So I will now turn to Ava so that she can discuss Baltimore's food waste recovery strategy and her involvement in the Food Matters pilot in Baltimore. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for that introduction. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Ava Richardson. Very uh, honored to uh, join you here and talk about some of the work that we're doing in Baltimore City regarding food waste reduction. Um, so this report that you see here, it is our Baltimore Food Waste and Recovery Strategy uh, that was authored um, in collaboration with 70 different organizations and individuals in the city. Um, and that really is a representation of how we do everything in Baltimore. Uh, we're very intentional about our efforts being community-led and inclusive, and so this, uh, when we wanted to address the food waste issue, we know it connects with rescue, and we know it connects with um, donation, getting food into people, and uh, getting food to people in need. But we also know we want to close that, uh, close the loop on on the food waste that we produce, and. Um, uh, as a result, we came up with a very robust strategy that had over 70 goals and objectives, um, and it actually led to my position. So I'm very fortunate <laughs> for for that uh, for this um, work that what was um, was forged, um, and subsequently. Oops. All right. Um, subsequently, uh, we, or in the report, we made some bold, audacious commitments. Um, first was 100% diversion of all waste produced at colleges and universities within the city. Um, second was a 90% diversion of the waste uh, produced within our K through 12 institutions. Um, third is what was a 80% reduction in um, food waste uh, generated uh, within our residential sector, as has, was mentioned. Uh, that that's the the biggest bulk of uh, our contribution to municipal solid waste. And uh, last was the commercial industry, so a 50% reduction by 2040. Um, and these actually laid the foundation to getting uh, support at the executive level of the city to a 50% um, reduction in food waste by 2030. Uh, so joining in the national trend. And... Um, uh, these efforts ultimately led to a grant from the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, which uh, funded the work that we're doing now. Um, and this has been a very rich collaborative effort with NRDC and Rockefeller, uh, leaning on their knowledge and expertise as it relates to food waste um, reduction and prevention, um, looking at all parts of the, the hierarchy that was mentioned earlier. Um, in addition, we, we were one of two cities selected, and so we, we will be working with them over the next couple of years. Uh, we were recently actually, uh, we recently released an application for $100,000 in funding for a, sm a small grants program that will be rolled out to um, different organizations for capacity building that are focusing on food waste reduction. And this is our team. And I, I must say, one of the um, most uh, rewarding and exciting things for me personally has been working with such a competent and, and valued uh, a team uh, at the city. Everyone's incredibly dedicated um, and, and it just really smart uh, to work with. Um, and my supervisor, Andretti, is also here. I'm just going to ask her to wave her hand. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's really been great working with her um, and just being able to learn from, uh, from all the work that everyone has done. And so coming into the position, it was uh, really set up to be successful the entire program. Um, 
Um, so now uh, we're just gonna go into one of the campaigns that we're rolling out in the city, which is the Save the Food campaign. And so I have a little video to show, uh, but um, this is just to kind of like lay the foundation when it comes to uh, reducing food waste and the Save the Food campaign is really looking at helping people uh, buy less, helping people or uh, you know just plan their meals better um, and so on and so forth. And so we're gonna go ahead and play this video. I think everyone will enjoy it. Trust me, it's, it's worth the wait. I hope no one in this room ever throws a strawberry away again, all right? <laughs> Um, so um, this video really shows kind of like that life cycle when it comes to our food from the farm to the um, processing plant um, then to the grocery store and then to our homes where oftentimes it ends up getting wasted and so um, I think the true beauty and power of this video is it, it shows that there's an incredible amount of water and energy and food as has been mentioned um, 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 earlier today that goes into growing our food and so when we throw it out we throw out all the, the human labor and the resources that went into that and so through the Save the Food campaign which which was a collaborative effort between NRDC and the Ad Council. Um, we really want to push this messaging out there um, that we have to change the culture around our food, really valuing it as the, the precious resource that it is. <clears throat> <We're> <laughs> to be continued. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, as um, um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, again, the food recovery hierarchy, and I show this really to contrast it to another hierarchy that um, was produced by an organization here in Washington, D.C., the food waste, um, the kind of like that, that highlights um, um, kind of incorporating community into the, the kind of uh, the food waste reduction process. And so this particular graphic was created by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and it really has this community composting infrastructure embedded in the solution so that we, we know we have to work at different parts of the hierarchy simultaneously and in that process we really want to get community members involved because when it comes to um, kind of getting to the end of that life cycle or getting to like the large scale changes we wanna see, really do have to um, focus on that behavior change in education. And this is our waste sort that was done in Baltimore City where we found that 25% uh, of the waste that we create is actually food. And I think I am almost done. Um, these are some of the things that we're working on in terms of residential, farmer's market collection. Uh, we are working to reduce food waste in our schools, and we are working in the commercial sector as well um, with different restaurants as well as large-scale um, institutions. And uh, these are some of my colleagues uh, doing a tour at one of our community composting locations. Um, thank you all very much. Well, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you very much. 
Ava, Richard, Lorenzo, and Katie. Uh, and what I'd like to do uh, is ask each one of our panelists a follow-up question, and then we'll turn it uh, to our audience. Uh, so we, we don't just have a lot of talent and experience uh, up here on the, uh, on the, the, uh, the panel uh, here, but we have a lot in the audience, and we'd like to uh, get to the audience as well and, and, and encourage you to share your experiences uh, for the benefit of all. But first, a question to uh, Katie. Beyond what uh, you've already discussed, what are some of the other impactful opportunities that, you could, uh, that can further reduce food loss and waste? Is, in your opinion, what are the type of organizations that are best positioned to lead these? Sure. Um, but I'd start by kind of, again, emphasizing the collaborative nature of addressing food waste. So I'd, I think within any solution or set of solutions, we're going to need some partnerships at the very least. Um, and in particular, I think there are opportunities for food businesses to become more aware of how much food they might be wasting through better data, metrics, and measurement. Um, and sharing that internally, sharing that with their CFOs, and helping starting to identify how much money are we actually leaving on the table by shrink and food loss and waste throughout our own operations. I think on the policy side, there's a huge opportunity for local, state, and federal policymakers to um, address some of the challenges that we see. For instance, date labeling's been mentioned a bunch of times. I want to say there are 41 or 43 states have conflicting date labeling policies, none of two of which are the same. <laughs> so, you know, especially kind of up in the, the tri-state area, you go to Vermont, you might need something different on cream cheese, you go across the border to New Hampshire, you need something different on sandwiches. And for uh, you know, businesses in particular, managing across those state lines is a, a challenge, um, and, it, and it costs money to do that. And so at a policy level, there are really big opportunities to help ease and make it easier to, um, for businesses and communities and practitioners to help or to actually take action. And then um, on the kind of capital and innovation side, I'd say there's a big opportunity for both philanthropic and public capital to help de-risk projects. And that's including infrastructure. We mentioned community, or in, mentioned composting and AD infrastructure, but also technology. There's a lot of innovation and in R&D that still needs to be done out there. And the private, se private capital isn't going to come in usually until we have that de-risked a bit and have it tested out and validated. So any opportunities there are for increased philanthropic capital flows for public grants to support that type of work and then also for food businesses and other community partners to be willing to test and pilot those solutions is absolutely critical. No, oh, thank you, Katie. So, you know, just a few, a few <laughs> recommendations there. <laughs> uh, Lorenzo, uh, based on your experience working with communities throughout the U.S., what consideration and recommendations do you have for communities that are trying to reduce their food loss and waste? Sure. I, I think there are, are a number of opportunities as well. Um, and I'll echo some of the things that Katie said on the, on the policy front, that there's, there's a wide range of, of types of policies that can be addressed. And some of them can even also be just goals. Uh, that, that Philadelphia project I was mentioning, the city has a zero waste plan and, and goals behind that. And that's, that's another driver that can be done at the local level. And uh, one of the things I'll, I'll note as a, as a helpful resource is that we're working with the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic right now to develop a toolkit on disposal bans and, and a whole host of other complementary um, strategies, programs, and policies um, that's coming out this spring. So uh, it'll definitely be linked to from our Wasted Food Solutions website, and, and I'm sure it'll get broadcast in lots of ways. We'll share it um, as broadly as possible. So that's a resource that's, that's coming that I think will help um, guide some folks. I think there's a, lots of opportunities for public-private partnerships uh, to get more of this done. Um, another Philadelphia example is, is the city's looking at um, using some city land to have uh, community-scale compost uh, done there. Um, and there's lots of that kind of work that can be done to spur additional infrastructure growth. And I think one thing that for communities to look at is, is helping the commercial side get diversion at scale will also then help uh, residential to kind of come on um, as a follow-on. We've seen that work in a lot of uh, places. And from our perspective, at least given the work that we do, supporting technical assistance um, is really important. That it's, it's our priority and many of our priorities here in this room, but it's not front of mind for, for most of the folks that we're trying to work with. So to make it as easy as possible and streamlined as possible is, is really important, and that technical assistance really accomplishes that. Um, and finally, I'll maybe wrap up that this is just a winning issue, uh, that this, this is something that um, it, it, makes, it makes good 
uh, environmental sense, it makes good economic sense, it's a job growth opportunity, it's good socially. Um, it, it's a winner on all, on all angles and it's a bar bipartisan issue. And so um, use that uh, platform that you have as, as communities to talk about this and raise awareness and get more activity happening. Great, thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, Richard, could you, could you highlight an example or two from the uh, Dose, Don't Waste Food SC campaign that maybe either contributed job opportunities or cost savings uh, for communities or organizations? Sure, uh, we've had, since when the campaign started, uh, uh, we only had one local government, Charleston County, that was uh, uh, doing any significant recycling with, and composting with wasted food. Uh, since the campaign went into effect and the compost regs, et cetera, passed, we have now four commercial compost haulers so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, processors, and we have some uh, haulers. We're composting at um, various school districts across the state, including Charleston County, Horry County, again, which is Myrtle Beach. Uh, we have businesses doing it, like Michelin and Millican, et cetera, GE. Uh, the word's gotten out, so they're doing it. And what the word we're getting back is there is some uh, savings as far as disposal costs. They may be offset or breaking even as far as getting it to the landfill, but there are some savings. Again, we're just, all this is just taking place. Our numbers of each of the past four years as far as what's been recovered has increased since the campaign started, which, which makes sense. It's not growing as fast as we'd hope, but it's going. So we see those samples where the businesses are in place. We have... Um, uh, they're uh, t to accept the food material, the food waste. They are getting it uh, uh, recovered. In some cases, in most cases, they are reducing their cost, uh, disposal, and breaking even. And we just see where this is a kind of a paradigm shift. It's going to happen more and more, uh, particularly with the schools, where they're going to be able to be better manage their waste, and that includes lower disposal cost and maybe even uh, some revenue later down <coughs> the road. So that's where we are, just Great. starting. Great examples. Uh, Ava, uh, based on your experience with Food Matters, uh, what practices would you like to see replicated in other cities across the country? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, I know there's some cities that are um, that have made a lot of progress on this issue. Um, and so I, I think it's one of the most important things is just kind of like that people uh, connection, that uh, community engagement aspect. I think um, too often uh, there's some level of complacency that um, some um, that that you can reach, and so I think it's really important to work very closely with local community leaders and engage residents to invest the time and the effort to educate them about the changes that are coming as it relates to uh, food waste or whether or not it's going to be um, curbside um, um, pickup, um, and also understand that this requires a, a huge degree and level of behavior change, and so we really um, from a psychological perspective have to understand like what are the the trigger the triggers and the nudges that really get people to change their behavior um, as Lorenzo men mentioned how do we make it easy for folks how do we remove barriers for people and, and how do we in the process uh, focus on improving our local economy um, and, and um, um, you know just thinking more critically about how we better manage our natural resources. So I, I think uh, San Francisco, uh, their ecology facility is a really great example. Um, they, and, and we've looked at some of their educational materials and are, are um, really taking and learning from that. And uh, uh, obviously um, Richard here is uh, doing some great work in South Carolina, so I think we have a lot to learn from them. So. <clears throat> great, thank you, Alva. So we now have uh, until what, a little after four o'clock, uh, where we can hear from, from all of you uh, and so during this time, we're going to welcome you to ask questions of our panelists or, or feel free to share lessons that you, uh, you've learned or, or your organization about reducing food loss and waste. So if, if you have an effective practice or resource that could help states, counties, and cities in reducing their f food waste, please go ahead and share that. Uh, perhaps uh, you'll, uh, you'll have a challenge that you'd like to share with the group or, or provide some sort of an insight. Um, so, so again, uh, we'll have... Um, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. There uh, are a couple of my colleagues from uh, EPA will be moving around the room. So uh, when they give you the microphone, if you would, please stand and introduce yourself uh, so that those viewing on uh, live, uh, the live stream can see and hear you and, you know, maybe keep your remarks a couple few minutes uh, because I think there are a lot of comments. So, so again, we'll go p a little past uh, 4 o'clock. We do have the room later, so we're not going to chase you out, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, please 
Uh, George Braun, I'm an attorney from San Diego, uh, came here 15 years ago. One of the questions I'm not seeing is, uh, I was a PACA attorney, where is Produce Marketing Association, Western Growers, all the brokers? I haven't seen any, you know, it would be a great thing to get this into the conventions that we have on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask you to further contextualize your question. Are you saying in terms of the rescue process or? Uh, bringing this into the conventions, the brokers who actually sell to the restaurants, okay. um, when, when we get bad f fruit in or something like that, it's you know, ripe that day, we usually have to donate it to somebody. And it would be a big help if we could have the organization you know, outreach to PMA, Western Growers, the people that actually sell to the restaurants or to the grocery stores. We are, in South Carolina, we are working with some of the food manufacturers, and I think um, Titan Foods and WP Roll and some others, um, getting, making sure they're aware of the issue, which they were, and help, they're helping us as far as their restaurants and uh, their clients, I should say, uh, get the word out. And, and we've seen a spike, an increase, obviously, in restaurants doing recovering food and working with us, or I should say rescuing food. And uh, so we have started that, but it, it, it's, one of the surprising things to me is as much as we want to do, it just takes a long time. It just does to get everybody on board. We're getting there, but we've been at it almost four years now, and it, it's still a lot of work to do. Uh, I'll maybe add to that just, just briefly that, that I, I think you're right, that that's, that is a, a big opportunity. I think it's also very timely, typically, when there's <laughs> uh, and that, but I think when we, for example, when we would do that expo, um, the exhibitors at the expo at the uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association were a lot of those distributors, manufacturers, and, and they are a great um, opportunity, those kinds of events to, to get the word out. And, and that's, uh, I think, a big part of, of a component of technical assistance too is just the information providing. So if there are, I'd, I'd love to follow up and learn what, more about what the events are that are, are valuable so that we can help get the word out uh, to those uh, constituents. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Nikki Freed. I'm Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Florida. So I wanna first off thank you for, for coming here today and putting on this presentation to the principals that were here earlier. Uh, here in the state of Florida, we have over a million pounds of fresh produce that left, get left on the vines every single year. Um, and so it is a main focus of my administration to figure out how we get the workforce, the volunteers, to go out there to take the produce off the vines and get it into whether it's farm to school programs and, and food deserts is another huge and insecurity in our state. So reprioritizing those and trying to figure out a way to get our farming community with our school system and our communities that are suffering so much from the food deserts. One of the other areas that uh, is happening already across the state is that local communities are going in and having food trucks. So they're going out to these farms, picking up their, their day-old produce or some of the stuff that's on the vines, and then taking it over to the food insecurity areas and either utilizing SNAP or just having free produce. Uh, the Department of Agriculture in 1994 created an, actually a food recovery program where when we have those kinds of interactions with our local farmers saying we have extra produce, we then couple with a lot of our local nonprofit organizations come out and do gleaning programs. And it's been tremendous success in getting the schools and young kids also out there, also encourages the next generation to care about what they're eating, how it's getting there, and to make sure, like has been said uh, throughout today, is that they have pride and ownership and making sure that they're not wasting it. Because I see kind of all this is kind of coupled together. You've got the food insecurity, uh, you've got the, the waste of the foods, and then we have energy problems as we see climate change happening across our country and across the world and these all kind of all interact together so thank you for your prioritizing this and know that you have a partner in the state of Florida uh, for any of the programs that we have uh, found youthful thank you uh, Pete Pearson World Wildlife Fund uh, I just want to detail a couple things that we've been working on. Some of them very closely related to agriculture, and we actually did field studies in Florida for tomatoes. Uh, this was part of our No Food Left Behind series. And what I want to highlight is that we are, we've kind of moved from doing field studies and really trying to measure, get out and do measurement in field, to now solution prototyping. 
Uh, and so later this summer and this fall, we're working with the design firm IDEO and the Global Cold Chain Alliance to start to prototype these solutions. Like how do you actually get food from field into market, do it profitably, right? This is a big issue. Like how, what are the solutions for it? Uh, the other couple things I'll highlight is, I think Katie mentioned it, the Pacific Coast Collaborative. This to me is a huge opportunity. You, you effectively have the cities along the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington who have made declarations and commitments to reduce food waste. Now it's, how do you do that, right? And so how do the cities, how do the jurisdictions make this happen? We've been working with them along with ReFed uh, to see how this actually forms. So I would tune everybody into the West Coast. And then finally, uh, we've been doing pilot projects in collaboration with folks like Melissa Terry and eight other cities across the country looking at food waste in schools. This is a, a sneaky little data project. We've been collecting data, doing food waste audits in about nine cities and dozens and dozens of schools and audits. So we're going to get ready at the end of this year to publish those results. And we hope that we can turn more classroom or cafeterias into classrooms by the start of next year. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, I'm Amy Keister with Compass Group. Um, it is such an honor to be here. A lot of friendly faces and a lot of new people. Um, Compass Group is the world's largest food service um, provider. We operate globally, but just here in the U.S., we serve almost 10 million, 10 million meals every single day. So three years ago, we decided to say, hey, we have the absolute best chefs. We love food. We think food brings people together. We have the scale and the passion to make real change. So we launched Stop Food Waste Day. Um, work very closely with Katie and Refed, and Ava, excited to hear Baltimore, is looking to sign on as well. But um, my ask for everyone here is we really need to work together, and we have the chefs, and we have really simple tools. We took a lot of information from the NRDC and a lot from Pete and the great work at the WWF, but to create super simple, because we know how to execute and how to get private sector behind it, we have the Fortune 500 companies behind us, most schools, most universities, museums, government institutions, unfortunately not EPA, USDA, or um, FDA food service, but come to Compass, we'll make sure you're where you need to be reducing your food waste. But my ask is if we really want to win, if you guys could all collaborate behind us, April 24th is Stop Food Waste Day. We'd love each and every one of you to help support us get the word out there, and if we can all work together, we can reduce this horrible epidemic. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the panel, and thank you to all the staff at EPA that put this together. Uh, my name is Adam Ortiz. I'm the director of Montgomery County's Department of Environmental Protection, and hello, Ava, Hi. and uh, <laughs> formerly the director of Prince George's County's um, Department of Environment, which is why I'm also representing NACO since I've worked for half of the counties in this region <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, but uh, the, um, Katie made the point about um, system solutions. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've been able to do in this region. So in Prince George's, um, there's actually the largest compost uh, processing facility, I think in the United States, that's owned by a municipality. About 60,000 uh, tons a year go through. But it was a team effort. There's no other way it could have been done unless the region really work together. So we have generators, including the federal government, that are uh, bringing us material. Nationals Park is bringing us material. The Smithsonian, thousands of uh, residents are giving us material curbside. Um, and uh, it's taken to this um, facility that's in a suburban county because it's not possible to site a facility like this in the city. So by working together, we're able to take so much material uh, from the city and the region and process it there. We also partner with the Maryland Environmental Service and Roy McGrath, who heads uh, that uh, group, is, is here and they operate the facility. And then we create a compost product, and to your point, Richard, that we sell for profit, that's sold for profit. And given the direction of um, the recycling markets internationally, um, uh, the, uh, how the business model is a little, little, little bit struggling, and how costly disposal is, uh, compost is, uh, and making a, a product at scale is really the solution going forward um, to, to making a sustainable model for, uh, for our waste streams. 
more than 30% of the material that's going to incinerators and landfills nationwide is actually food scraps, and that's value. That's material that can be sold as a commodity. So I'm not just here sort of tooting our horn here as a region, which I'm proud of, but also asking the panel if there are any other examples of regional cooperation that's also made a business model that works. Anybody want to? Um, I do think that there's a lot of uh, uh, regionalness for, for this, and I think um, especially because many food businesses have multiple locations across either county or state lines, they're looking for solutions at scale, and so um, those, those sort of chain-wide solutions are, are really helpful at all levels of the hierarchy for prevention, donation, and, um, and food scrap processing, whatever that might be. And I think that at that processing level, there's lots of different um, types of solutions. Those are sort of necessarily local. The food waste doesn't travel very far, typically. Uh, but at least in the, the Northeast states, we're seeing a lot of kind of interstate um, work. And, and, and with policies being pretty similar in a lot of the New, the New England states, um, it's sort of creating a lot more environment for collaboration and, and sort of similarity across uh, that landscape. So I'm not sure if that exactly gets at, at it, but that's one example that we're, we're seeing quite a bit um, in the work that we're doing, at least. And, and not quite an answer to your question, but would also encourage you to think creatively, not just about the different business models and the technology innovations, but also like financial innovations. Like, what are unique financing mechanisms that could be supporting this? I and mean, you said you're already selling compost for profit. That's already a step in the right direction. But even looking at how could you be working with your um, regional agencies to address tipping fees and actually make it absolutely cost effective to be composting or sending food waste to AD instead of landfill. I'm a Texan. or a place where that's a hard battle to fight because there's so much space. And you know, now I live in New York where it's the opposite argument. But that's thinking about creative contracts and making, you know, thinking about the energy sector and how power purchase agreements revolutionize the ability to create, uh, to attract capital. Thinking about feedstock agreements and different types of ways that you could really strengthen the business model through those innovative thinking, not just through new technology or new partnerships as well. So it didn't answer your question, but some more ideas for you. I would say, I, just to tag on to what Katie said, um, in Baltimore, we, because we are a local government, so a lot of our work is hyper-local, um, but we do have some smaller scale operations, not nearly 60,000 tons annually, but uh, we, we have saw the Filbert Street Garden in South Baltimore, which is um, providing a monthly service for people who actually want to uh, have curbside pickup. And so um, Marvin Hayes, the gentleman that runs that, he's a master composter, he runs that, he picks up and he processes roughly four to 800 pounds a week um, at his garden. Um, and they also have uh, several different school groups that come out there to learn about the composting process, learn about urban agriculture. There are goats and ducks on the farm as well. And so um, we know that we, we want to scale that type of model. And in Baltimore, we are siting facilities. We are looking to grow. Uh, we're, we're kind of trying to compete with you, Adam, uh, but uh, we're, we're looking to get to that point. Um, but you know, it, um, as I think Richard mentioned earlier, uh, it takes time to get to that point, and, and it really re requires investment and, and kind of de dedication from um, so many different levels. And so we know that the planning process could be years out, um, but we're, 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 we're working on it and seeing what, uh, 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 what collaborations can be done with other, either other jurisdictions or um, um, in the region bro more broadly. I think that was a good segue. Hi, I'm Mark Inkrop with the I'll Upfield Group. And we have a program called Farm to Fan. And basically, you know, to your point on the regional application here, so our program is working with convention centers, uh, sports programs, and universities to help them divert food waste uh, to anaerobic digesters. And we, we like this Farm to Fan concept because whenever possible, yes, we want to feed people. That's why farmers go to work in the morning. But when it's not possible, can we use that food to create renewable energy? And we talked a little bit about anaerobic digestion and the outputs, for those that aren't aware, is uh, energy and fiber. And on a farm, we can use those fibers for bedding for animals. We can use it for fertilizers and different applications. And from an energy standpoint, we can use that energy to uh, power a farm. And so if we follow food through the supply chain, we're able to capture waste at the farm level, specifically in livestock agriculture, at the manufacturer, as well as our clients at the uh, university, at the convention center, and at the professional sports 
area. So if we can take that food and bring it back to the farm and use that to generate electricity and to generate fiber, uh, we found the triple bottom line in that. But the social good is there, the environmental good is there, but we can now work with our clients to generate sponsorships and partnerships and create a story. And the uniqueness of sports, the same reason why we're doing things with the nationals, we do it with our clients so that we can you know, take advantage of that uniqueness um, of, of being able to create awareness and to create sponsorship opportunities and find community partners, specifically, hopefully, the, ch the champions that we work with to put their name right beside you know, their clients that they're already working with uh, for the greater good. And so um, you know, my question, I guess, is when you think about you know, the work being done in Baltimore and you say 100% of food diversion, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more of your thoughts and if we can possibly help you with that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, that uh, di diversion, specifically referring to diverting food away from our landfill and our incinerator, um, um, and so in that process, uh, we want to, I think that, that specific number was uh, relating to colleges and universities, and so uh, we want to work with colleges and universities to help them first reduce their waste by right size ordering, um, and also help them to get the food to the students. Uh, there, Johns Hopkins University, they are developing an app um, that can be leveraged in this way, and they also have um, campus-wide food alerts. And so um, we have a group of sustainability experts in the city uh, that are associated with these universities that meet and I presented to them. So we're trying to figure out how we can collaborate, how the city can collaborate with these entities in order to help um, get them to commit um, kind of more broadly uh, across the city to some food waste um, diversion or food waste goals. Um, and then when it comes to the diversion, uh, we know campuses are in many ways a very controlled kind of ecosystem and we can control those ecosystems to be a system as we want them to be. And so in that process, we really do want to um, have the, the leaders, the presidents of the schools and um, it, the people that have the decision-making power, we want them to really focus on getting the organics materials to a facility that can recapture it, either going back into the soil through composting or um, um, through anaerobic digestion. So, uh, so yeah, that's, I'd love to talk to you more about it and uh, how we can collaborate. Uh, well, Ted, yeah. Thank you, appreciate that. I'm Ted Monk, I lead uh, sustainability for Sodexo. Uh, we're a founding signatory of Champions 2030 and proud to be the endorser of the year last year for the EPA, so thank you for that recognition. Um, really, food, waste, food loss and waste is a change management process, and the beginning of that change management process, we found you absolutely have got to spend so much time on the behavior change and the awareness. You can change other things later on, but unless that fundamental, and from our experience, when we sit down and talk to hourly employees who are doing the work and are making the decisions, they know full well how to reduce food waste in the first place and how to connect it with their local communities. Because for the majority of them, they know people who are food insecure, if indeed they're not food insecure themselves in some cases. So... The, the behavior change and the awareness is absolutely the first point. The second point I would make is about process change. And we can change um, some things in terms of menus, etc. But if there was an ask for anybody in this room that has any responsibility over contract management, it would be to look at the contracts that you have and, and whether they are... Um, whether they're in line with the goals of reducing food waste by 50%, because I know there are contracts in our organization that prohibit food recovery, and we're having to negotiate with clients to do those things. So I think contract renegotiation is a point that needs to be uh, brought up. I also think just the, the whole way that food service is designed in terms of equipment, so whenever there's any kinds of refurbishments, taking the opportunity to look at how you can redesign a food service operation in order to be more efficient and to reduce food waste. So, but my big ask is anybody in this room that has contract management responsibility, help us with that. Thank you. Could I? Um, oh, go. I'd yes. like to just, just piggyback on that because I, I really think that there's a lot there that, that I think uh, in our perfect world, um, we wouldn't even be needed because it would just be the normal way of doing business would be to do all the steps of the hierarchy and, and address food waste as just the normal practice of doing business. And 
Um, I think we are making some incremental steps in that direction. Uh, there's, a, there's one of the supermarket chains that we've worked with for, for a very long time, Big Y Foods, they're uh, based in the Northeast, and they got about 70 stores that, that now, as we used to have help them over and over with each store that they're working with, but now it's really institutionalized in the way that they do their work. They have great steps for prevention. They do, they're really up in their game on donation. Um, they're doing lots for not just food waste, but recycling overall. And, and they're doing that on their own now, and it's become part of their normal course of business. And it makes good business sense. It's, it's given them about a boost to the bottom line of about $3 million a year chain-wide when they're doing all of those activities. So when you, when you have that kind of impact that's social, financial, and just part of the way of doing business, and it and becomes contractual and all those things, I, that's when we really see big change, and it sustains itself. So I, I, I agree with that. Um, and then I'd, I'd also build on that and say that ensuring that employee incentives are aligned appropriate, appropriately to advance those types of goals are important as well. And in thinking about kind of how are you encouraging your employees to reduce food waste? And one kind of key example could be in grocery retail, they might be calculating donation tax incentives at the corporate level, and that might not be getting back to the, the store level P&L. And so thinking about how those communication streams work within your company and within your food business and making sure that frontline staff are seeing the benefits that the corporation overall might be reaping from, or might, might be reaping, and then making sure that incentive structures either kind of encourage or promote more food waste reduction, or at least don't encourage wasting more food unintentionally, hopefully. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm Jeff Wadey. I'm the Secretary of Agriculture in the state of New Mexico, and, and this year I serve as President of the National Association of State Departments of Ag. And first of all, I'd like to thank the three agencies, EPA and, and USDA and FDA, for you know, bringing this up about 10 notches in the discussion. Um, I, I think it's, it's opportunities like this that we all have to take advantage of. But when I, And you guys have hit on a lot of hot buttons for me today. When we talk about food waste, and, and you think about the resources that the, that the farmer or rancher have used. And, we, and, and I guess in doing research, 30 to 40% seems to be like a nice round number at every level of the thing, of, of the supply chain, every level, from the grower to the transporter to the, to the retailer to the, to the manufacturer to the processor to the, to the consumer. It seems like 30 to 40% seems to be a magic number. But one fact I did find was that uh, it impacts about 24% of the resources that we put into growing the food. And if you think about that, that's huge, especially when you come from a state like New Mexico where we got uh, water is our most precious natural resource. And if, I had, if my farmers had 24% more water, it would make a big difference when we're allocated maybe 10 to 15 inches a year for, for irrigation. That's beside the point. Just the resource issue is, is, is key. But a few years ago, we... Uh, the food banks in New Mexico came to me and they wanted to partner with us as a state agency to try to reach the producers. The, to the commissioner from Florida's point, we have a lot of produce that gets left in the field. How do we get that to people? And so we just simply sent out a letter to the, to the produce growers and that created a relationship between the food banks and the growers. And the first year, first couple years, it was they would come in and glean and do things. It turned into a business relationship where they weren't making any, the growers weren't making any money out of this, but they would grow a certain part of their field for the food banks. So it turned into a, so they would have a steady stream of, of supply, which was a good thing. So, so there was, we celebrate every year several million pounds going from the field to the food banks in our state, which is tremendous. Now, on another issue that I'm, I'm hot on these days is school cafeterias. 31 million kids around the country, 100,000 plus schools, and they all feed these kids. And, and when you look at the data, and I think Florida did some research, and I'd be curious, uh, World Wildlife left, I guess, um, be curious about the data they come out with. But again, about 31 to 34 percent gets wasted. We spend a lot of time, USDA, the State Departments of Ag, and others spend a lot of time promoting and marketing by local into the school system, farm to school pro programs. And I was sitting in a, in a meeting with all the school cafeteria people in New Mexico, and uh, 
one of the things that was brought up, and I didn't ask, I'm just sitting there listening to the discussion, but we're finally hitting where we're getting more local produce into the school system. And the comment was made by each of them about how much less waste was occurring because the kids were excited about eating the stuff their neighbor grew. So there's many opportunities, I think, in, in this uh, arena for food waste, and that's the, to expand on that buy local movement, to expand on the salad. The kids loved the salad wagons. You know, they didn't like the thing where you go through the cafeteria. They liked going around the salad wagon and picking up way more stuff and eating it than they did going through the line. So there's a lot of little things that, that we found. Um, so anyway, this year the public education department and our department of ag are going to partner on a big promotion on food waste in the schools. So thank you guys for all that you do and we got a lot of work to do. I'm just going to take this opportunity to continue the agriculture boost. I'm Barb Glenn. I'm the CEO of NASDA, and I'm blessed to have Secretary Witte here. He's the president and Commissioner Freed. I just wanted to share with you that uh, we actually focus on agricultural policy, and we're excited to now be more engaged in reducing food waste from the NASDA United Voice perspective. So we look forward to working with each and every one of you, and feel free to contact myself or Aline DeLucia. She's here representing NASDA as well. So think about your State Department of Agriculture Commissioner, Secretary, or Director. They're great partners in these efforts. Thank you. Um, hi, Maureen Walsh with the American Biogas Council. Um, this is probably more directed to your question. Um, you know, one of the things that um, you guys could probably be thinking of, you're absolutely right, composters, they take up a lot of space. They're usually a little bit further out from, um, from population centers where digesters, the gentleman sitting in front of you, can actually kind of bridge that gap and actually get the energy portion out of uh, the, the food as well with a final product that's along the lines of compost. Um, look at uh, the resources that are literally in your backyard, wastewater treatment facilities. Think about co-digestion. Um, that really is a phenomenal resource. A lot of communities are looking at it. Um, you have a great example um, not too far from you at DC Water. Um, they're very much looking at that. Um, but one of the drivers is, and this is my pivot, uh, some of the federal policies that are that are driving um, digester development. One of them is uh, the renewable fuel standard. Phenomenal opportunity for not only making electricity, but also making renewable fuels. One of the things that we're seeing um, within the structured EPA, not specifically within your area, but over at OTAG, is that um, splitting a digester when it comes to um, a cellulosic fuel and a advanced fuel is very complicated and it's quite cumbersome. There are a lot of digesters that want to be taking in food waste. It makes phenomenal biogas. Um, it also makes wonderful um, digestate product. But when they're disincentivized because their, their entire load of biogas is going to be kicked over to um, a much more it's at least, the, the economics don't make nearly as much sense on the D5 side of things. So they're, they're letting it go to a landfill, which is where it perversely makes a D3 RIN. So this incentiv incentivization is really being used in a perverse way to bring those, those very products that we're trying to, um, we're trying to digest and make better products out into a landfill instead of a digester. So we'd love to see if the EPA could um, could start to address this. There's been a proposal that's been before the EPA for some time, and we'd love to see some type of resolution come to it to see you know a greater incentivization of bringing it to a digester. I just want to maybe I'll add one thing about digestion that that I meant to say earlier, but I, you, your comments reminded me that it's one of the spaces where there's been so much innovation is in the digestion world, and sort of a part of that has been in the depackaging. So, uh, so much of the, the wasted food that's kind of available that was so challenging to manage was packaged foods and there's been tremendous growth and innovation in that space that's kind of separating those two components, the packaging from the food itself and, and really does that pre-processing step that makes it very uh, applicable for digestion. 
Um, so, so there's innovation kind of everywhere you look in this space, um, but that's one of the places where it's kind of unlocking some potential that's especially applicable for AD. Hi there, thank you. I'm Del Hudson. Um, I'm with a non-profit think tank called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to firstly say thank you um, both uh, to the administration, the agencies, um, bringing this collaborative uh, initiative together, which is just incredible. And obviously, uh, as an organisation like ours, focused on system level change, couldn't be more timely. I uh, wanted to say <coughs> particular thanks to Katie and the work that Refed is doing. Um, really just so critical that the um, economics are laid out clearly um, and the valorisation of food waste um, it's just such a profound opportunity. I wanted to give a small plug to a recent piece of research that we've done uh, and launched at the World Economic Forum in Davos just in January. Um, we were looking at the opportunity that cities can play and peri-urban regions can play um, as an intervention point in global food systems, knowing that by 2050, around 80% of all food will be consumed in cities. Um, so how can we turn cities from being sort of sinks or drains uh, from those nutrients uh, across our biocycles uh, to really uh, junctions that actually return those valuable nutrients out into the ecosystem? Um, and through that research, uh, we really uncovered an opportunity that there are three critical points. I want to also uh, acknowledge Mark's point here about the importance of looking further upstream at... Um, at waste capture opportunities. Uh, the three areas um, that our circular economy framework lays out is really around making the most of food, so food waste, but also byproduct and co-product um, right through to the biosolid end of the system. Uh, food design, so upfront production, uh, what goes into food, um, and also thirdly, sourcing. Um, and procurement being a critical part of the decision-making process. So anyone who's interested in looking at um, the circular economy as a framework for uh, delivering local and regional level food strategies, um, come see me afterwards. I'm happy to uh, point you in the right direction and send you a link to that. Um, I also, we've just, after launching that piece of work uh, that took a, took about a year of research, we're now moving into a mobilisation phase where we have a call to action out for three global cities to actually pilot um, a regional um, circular economy for food, looking at selecting uh, one in Europe, one in North America, uh, and one in um, South America, potentially. So um, anyone who has uh, sort of anything interesting to share about work that's happening locally um, and, and areas and regions, cities, that may be interested in that work. I have to say, I'm based in Portland, Oregon, so I'm a little, uh, I'm a little biased around where good work is happening. Uh, but thank you again, and uh, and keen to learn more about um, innovative strategies going on locally. Oh, hi, my name is Ines, and I'm a reporter of E and E News. And I had a question regarding uh, food waste and climate change. I was just wondering, you know, how much food waste actually contributes to methane and CO2 emission, and if it's something that you guys looked at. Thank you. So, according to the FAO, food waste contributes about eight percent of global greenhouse gases. And if it's kind of hard to compare food waste to some of the other sectors because it crosses over so much with things like transportation or agriculture or waste management. And so there, you know, if you really want to get into the science of it, it's hard to break food waste out specifically. But it is a major contributor. Um, it's the single largest contributor of methane from our landfills. And methane, as you may already know, is, you know, 20 to 27 EPA, correct me. Um, times <laughs> more potent than other greenhouse gases. And it does have significant climate effects also from the fact that we're extracting so many resources. So, gentlemen, uh, you had mentioned that, you know, we're wasting about 20% of all of the natural resources that go into food and pulling phosphorus, pulling nitrogen, pulling all of that out of the ground does not help protect our, our environment and the climate. So. Um, you may be familiar with Project Drawdown, which uh, came out as the most comprehensive plan to address global warming. Eight of the 20 top solutions were food-related, and the number three 
solution is reducing food waste. And that's specifically pr the prevention side. That doesn't even include the composting and, and other components of addressing food waste. Um, so it's, I say, all in, it's a humongous opportunity to address climate change. And I think one that the, the kind of climate community or climate change activist and funding community is starting to get more engaged in. Uh, we're seeing folks like Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation establish food waste as a priority among their climate programs. Climate Works, which is a funder collaborative, is just, you know bringing on their first food waste fellow. So it's uh, starting to become more more known that it, this is an opportunity, but absolutely one of the the major significant ways that we could address climate change now and c quickly. And just to add yeah. to Katie's comment, um, if, if, according to research done by the NRDC, um, if um, food waste was a country, it would be the, lar the third largest contributor um, to greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And so um, when we think of like food waste uh, um, from a food systems and climate change perspective, um, I, I do think of it from the nexus of like food, energy, and water because of all these resources that go into that system. And so I think um, part of it is really rethinking um, or redesigning our food system so that we are producing um, um, more foods that are climate resilient and that allow our communities to be resilient, whether it is to drought, um, we are restoring our soils, and, and um, we're, we're promoting more sustainable practices with, within um, um, our cities as well as within the, 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 the areas that surround them. So um, I think, thank you for that uh, question. It was a great, great one. Uh, hi, my name is Sally Greenberg. I'm executive director of the National Consumers League, and um, uh, the consumer perspective, I think, is really important. Uh, thank you all on the panel for really uh, terrific work. And uh, I, one thing I want to say is that this is a great nonpartisan, bipartisan issue, which we don't see very often in this environment. So I'm particularly delighted to see folks from all over the country here uh, agreeing that this is a, a national epidemic uh, on uh, food waste. Um, and um, I wanted to note that several years ago, the National Consumers League and several other partners, um, we worked with World Wildlife, I'm glad to see you, Pete, on uh, a food waste conference uh, with the Secretary Vilsack and uh, executive at, uh, or high-ranking high official Stan, his name's going to escape me, but I'm sure you guys know him from EPA, who spoke about the role consumers have in food waste, and so I think it's really important to wrap that up into uh, all the discussions we're having. But I'm a little bit fixated on this goal that we have, which is that we want to reduce food waste by 50% in uh, 2030. Uh, that's 11 years from now. We've got an, an incredible array of wonderful programs uh, happening around the country in states around the country and cities around the country. Who's gonna hold us to that number? How are we going to measure and, 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 and uh, do the kind of benchmarking that you do when you have a goal? And I'm hoping that the folks on the panel, the, the EPA and the Department of Agriculture and the FDA uh, will uh, begin to quantify this and make us stick to that number. And, what does 50% reduction look like? Is it only 30 billion? What is that number? 30 billion tons, six, or 63 million tons of food? It must be billion, right? Tons of food wasted. 40% uh, does it mean in, in uh, 2030 we have 20, only waste 20% of our food? I'd love to know more about how we get to that number, and I hope we can all make a commitment to try to uh, hold us to uh, uh, some metrics and some benchmarks. Um, one of the priorities for ReFed this year is actually updating our roadmap, including creating dynamic models to actually track progress against the national goal to cut food waste in half. So we've been doing, uh, we've spent kind of several months so far and are continuing to build out data collection platforms and partnerships with different jurisdictions, different companies, different innovators who are, you know, apps who are doing food recovery, who are collecting a lot of data. So finding all of the data sources. Um, including the ones that EPA, USDA, and other agencies put out. We're putting those together into a dynamic data model so we can actually track progress over time, which is something that we, I think we and no one else in the world has been able to do so far on food waste. So I'd say we are working on it for you and um, also planning to, kind of through this partnership that we signed with the, the agencies today, 
Um, also looking for opportunities to be more collaborative with them and make sure that this is elevated to the national level and that we can see exactly what kind of progress we're making. We're also kind of to that, that last part you were asking about, you know, is it 30 million, is it 20%? We are also thinking about that in terms of, you know, population's gonna grow. So at the end of the day, 50% in 2015 might mean something really different than 50% in um, 2030. So we're also incorporating that into our models and taking into account kind of what it will actually mean to have food waste cut in half. So we're on it for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely think that, that uh, REFED is, is uh, very well equipped to tackle that um, quantification, especially at the national level. But I'll, I'll also add as, as states and, and cities are are making their own goals and policies around this, They're, they are uh, focused on ways to measure and keep track of this. So it's a little bit more contained at, at sort of the local or, or state level, and there are a number of examples around the country where, where significant efforts are underway to, to be tracking that, reporting it out, um, and monitoring over, over time. Um, so. Um, but, but definitely I'll yeah. refer to Kate at the national level. <laughs> and, I, and I just say we will be building upon those. We won't be replacing those or taking those for granted. We'll be building upon the great work that's already been done there and not trying to recreate the wheel or reinvent new systems where we don't need to. Sweet. So. Well, I think we have time maybe for a couple more. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Roy McGrath. I'm director of the Maryland Environmental Service. I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the leadership in this room. Uh, I came here hoping to uh, learn and hear more and celebrate this uh, wonderful initiative on food waste. And instead I'm going to leave really excited and enthusiastic about the amount of passion and commitment that is being brought to the table to try to do something about what is clearly a systemic problem in our country. So I thank EPA and our federal partners for your leadership. I also want to acknowledge the incredible state um, engagement and activity. We've heard from a number of state secretaries who are here. Uh, our own state secretary, Ben Grumble, signed the uh, placard over here. I noticed that while I was sitting down. And um, the governors who are um, bringing a lot to the table from the states, our own governor, Larry Hogan, who's been incredibly supportive of the initiatives um, across the environment, but in particular, with our independent agency where we're trying to do um, all that we can in collaboration with our partners uh, to make an impact on this important area. My colleague uh, from Montgomery County, formerly of Prince George's County, Adam Ortiz, uh, mentioned their incredible leadership uh, in Prince George's County on food waste composting. We're very proud to be a part of that partnership. It's one of a thousand different projects that we participate in, not only in Maryland, but across the Mid-Atlantic region. And I think collaboratively, we're really making an impact. One of the things I get asked a lot, um, particularly in light of our food composting partnership, is about scalability. And um, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts. I can tell you in our own case, we've tried to live by example. And uh, we implemented a food waste composting operation in our own headquarters. We have uh, 250 people there. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to divert 300 pounds of food waste. Um, so whether it's small like that or whether it's the 30,000 tons that are being processed at the uh, facility in Prince George's County, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people who are committed and passionate about this. And I have to recognize my uh, friend here, my new friend from Baltimore City, uh, for their interest in uh, uh, initiative and leadership in the area too. Thank you. And I just want to say in Baltimore City, the Department of Planning, we also recently, or we, we will be implementing an office composting program. And uh, we're really looking at that to change all of our government buildings in the city to the point where they are zero waste. So um, it really just starts with that one. And so hopefully maybe across the state and across the city, we'll see that change happening. In the back. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, my name is Melissa Terry. I'm a K through 12 food policy researcher and had the honor to work with the EPA and the USDA on the student food waste audit guide. I'm really excited to hear state agriculture departments and state ed folks working together. Um, I'm a farm kid and you can't waste food and stay in business. And um, to me, it's just it's such an easily solvable problem. And I also teach at a public school, and I know for a fact that cafeterias are classroom, whether we intend it or not, they're learning stuff, and so the farm to school program 
is a really great vehicle for all of that, and I'm really thankful for the USDA's work in that. So if anybody, um, I, I also would be remiss not to point out the World Wildlife Fund, Amanda Stone is still here, and our Student F Food Waste Audit Research Project. We are in nine cities, and it's deployed right now. We're gonna have a boatload of good data, and I hope that all of you data geeks will help look at it with us. Uh, when that comes in, but for now, uh, if any of you are interested in um, getting engaged, if you're not already, I would be happy to talk to you after this session is over. Okay, well, I think, uh, I think you would all agree with me that this has really been a, a, just a great discussion, and, and so uh, my thanks to all of, uh, all of the great participation by our, our attendees. I mean, that, that, you know, the number of incredible ideas, uh, you know, uh, generated today. I'm, I'm glad that this is hopefully also being recorded as well as live streamed uh, because I, I think there are too many ideas that have been shared to uh, even rely on anybody's note-taking abilities. So we're excited really to, at, here at EPA to have so many organizations, uh, you know, many who are here today working towards the national goal of, you know, reducing food waste uh, loss by 50 percent, but it, it, that's a goal. We can exceed by 2030. If we hit it earlier, we exceed it. Uh, that would be terrific. That it's not a limit. Um, uh, and 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 I think as the discussion here has demonstrated, that there's a, really a role to be played by all sectors of of uh, you know of the economy, of government, of NGOs. Uh, it, 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 you know, and, and again, it's, it's very exciting to hear that so many sectors are already playing, contributing ideas. Um, hopefully that a lot of the ideas that you've heard today are, are things that can be shared then with, uh, you know, across those who have not yet heard the ideas and, and have not yet had the opportunity to implement them. So again, I appreciate that so many of you are obviously personally leading, you know, change and, and really making a difference. Uh, and I'm hopeful that, um, you know that, that you know for many of you who some who've no, known each other before, but others are, are maybe making a first-time connection and can continue that because I think that's certainly going to be have an important role in in continuing to make progress. So uh, we encourage you to collaborate in in any ways that you can help each other to make this national goal. Again, we do have the room until five o'clock, so <laughs> please feel free to stay and have conversations, share contact information to support uh, the collaboration. Uh, you know, we're, we're um, again, we're so glad uh, that you could all join us today for this uh, program and, and for all of your support, good efforts, goodwill. Uh, and again, thanks so much for being here. And uh, one final thanks to our panel for uh, excellent presentation, great answers. Thank well, thanks very much. That was terrific. That was great. You put your papers out just like an attorney would. My partner is an attorney, and this is what I We're just getting started. You missed me. I was the best looking guy there, wasn't I? How you been? I saw you earlier and didn't get a chance to say hey. He's already going to be in Chicago. Well, I appreciate it.